So when we talk about the glass castle and really when we talk about literature in general, there is a. There is an understanding that you are going to hit symbols and metaphors, but there is a difference between a symbol and a metaphor. Remember, a symbol is a very specific type of metaphor, and if we think of something as a specific type of something else, we automatically assume that all symbols are going to be superior. Oh, well, it's a different type. It's a very specific type. Therefore, it has to be better. You have to be careful with that because actually when we talk about the idea of symbol versus metaphor, complex metaphors can be dragged out throughout a narrative, and that's actually what we see with the glass castle. So in order for you to understand this concept, I'm going to I'm going to do a little exercise with you. I'm going to give you an abstract idea, OK? So when I say the word symbol, remember a symbol is a concrete object that stands for an abstract idea. A concrete object is something that can be made out of concrete. That's the, re the easiest way to remember it. It's an object. It's a thing that you could carry, right? So an abstract idea are things that you cannot touch. For example, loyalty or freedom or success or love or friendship. These are all abstract ideas or abstract nouns. A symbol, which is a concrete version of one of those, is best understood through our most basic understanding of immediate response. When I say one of those words, something pops up into your head. If I say the word friendship, there's probably either a person or an object that pops up into your head. So what we're going to do is I'm going to say an abstract noun and I want you to say the first symbol that pops into your head, but I want you to type it into the chat. OK, so what's the first symbol that pops in your head when I say the word love? What's a symbol for love? When I say what love? Type it in the chat. What is a symbol for love? OK, so most of you guys. Are saying that this. Is a symbol for love, OK? That is a heart, but I want you to ask yourself, is that really a heart? Is that really what a heart anatomically looks like? Like if I were to open up your chest and pull out your heart, it wouldn't actually look like that pretty little diagram there. It would probably look a little bit more like this. Got some veins going on over here, some veins here, right? I think there's actually a third ventricle. Isn't there like a third one back here somewhere? See, there's one there, right? There's another here. All right, if I pulled it right out of your chest, it would probably be like shooting blood everywhere. And then, blah, 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 right? So if you look at the thing on the right there, all sort of covered in blood and like veiny and like that's not really like that's kind of gross. That's not really a symbol of love, but we have sort of taken this idea here and we've turned it into this idea here, OK? Now, for my deep, deep thinkers, this idea here is what Ferdinand de Saussure, a linguist, calls a sign. This is a signifier. This is the actual thing, but we've kind of smoothed that out and we've made it into the hallmark version of that. And so when I say love, this is the symbol. This one right here is the symbol that you think of, but this is just a representation of what this is, right? So you tell me in the chat box, why is it that we associate a heart with love? Why do we associate a heart with love? And just type it in the chat box. Why do we do that? You're not wrong, but tell me why. Got to give me something, guys. 
I need a response. I'm going to start calling on people. Why do we associate love with our hearts? What happens to us? When we see someone we love. Good, Blanford, exactly right. Your heart races, right? Your pulse rises. You get that butterfly feeling in your chest, okay? Um, or for some of us, if, it, if we're talking about like familiar love, like, like family love, it's a warm feeling like in your heart. You feel fulfilled in your heart. The heart area, the chest area of you feels full when you're around your family or you're around your best friends or any of those things, okay? So when we talk about the idea of a symbol, a symbol, this thing right here, is it's an okay thing, right? It's all right. It's not the best representation, but there is definitely a better representation of love. So I'm going to start drawing a better representation of love, and I want to see if you guys can figure out what it is. So as soon as you figure out what it is, type it in the chat box. Ah. Yep. Good. Hang on, I'm not done yet. And this is an important distinction to make. not just a rose it's a what you're right it's a rose but it's not just a rose as soon as you figure it out type it in the chat box there it is it's a rose bush it's not just a cut rose it's a rose bush Now, every rose bush doesn't just have roses and leaves growing off of it, right? What else does a rose bush have that I'm not drawing very well because I'm doing it on this thing here? There it is. Thorns. 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 Uh-huh. Absolutely. Now, my beautifully intelligent, wonderfully awesome, amazing second period, think about it for a moment and tell me why is a rose bush a better and more complex symbol for love than this? What does a rose bush do that love also does? It hurts, absolutely. Yep, it can definitely hurt you. It's not all bad though. What else? Because it's not all bad. It grows. Beautiful. Absolutely, El Shami. It grows. Can it create new loves? Brings joy. Very good, Morris. Extend the metaphor. It makes more of itself. Excellent, Blanford. Think about roses that are in a garden versus roses that are growing out in the wilderness. How does that relate to the idea of love? Have you ever seen wild roses? Have you ever seen them? I have. They have them on the Appalachian Trail. Ah, Blanford. 
it's better for love not to be contained. So when we talk about the idea of wild roses, can love grow wild? Can love just happen even if it's not cultivated? It just happens in the wild, like seemingly out of nowhere, okay? If you don't take care of love, if you don't feed it and it doesn't get enough attention, can it die? Can it come back even though, yes, it wilts? Beautiful use of verbs there, Blanford, yeah. Can it come back even though it seems to be dead? Have you ever seen a rose do that? It just seems to be this stubby little wooden thing and then, yeah, it can be revived. So do you see how the rose bush itself becomes a better, more complex metaphor for love? So I'm going to bring you back to me. And we're going to talk about how this relates to the glass castle. All right, so if you can see me, type yes in the chat box. Can you see me? Blanford, yes, cutting the wilted parts off. Yeah, if you're in a relationship, like a relationship that needs to be in some way trimmed, absolutely. Let's get rid of the stuff that we don't need and let's make our relationship better, okay? All right, so in the glass castle, we have a symbol and we have a metaphor. OK, the symbol, if you guys remember, the symbol is the Joshua tree. So remember how the mom and um, Jeanette Walls are driving along and they see the Joshua tree and it's twisted and like its branches are all like, you know, gnarled looking and it looks like it's just like fighting for its life. Right. And Jeanette Walls is like, that is the <laughs> that is an ugly tree. Like that's an ugly tree, mom. But her mom says, no, actually, it's probably the most beautiful tree I've ever seen. And the mom says that the fact that the wind blew and, you know, it's been dehydrated and it's come back and it's like grown in this very wild, gnarled way, that's what's that's what makes it beautiful. And Jeanette Walls wants to take one of the saplings from underneath the Joshua tree and she wants to take it home and and basically raise it in her garden and keep it away from the wind and the sun and all of those things. And the mom says that defeats the purpose of the Joshua tree. The reason the Joshua tree is beautiful is because it is all gnarled, because it's gone through all of these tribulations and survived. And that's what makes it an interesting, beautiful tree, right? They literally have to stop on the side of the road so you can paint this tree. That tree is a symbol of the viewpoints of these two people in this memoir. Jeanette Walls views life as something that needs to be nourished and protected and kept away from the sort of tragedies that she herself had to go through, right? Her mother, on the other hand, says, well, actually, it's all of the tragedies and the hardships that have made the tree beautiful. So that's two different viewpoints on what we should do as far as like growing up in the world. And growing up in the world, Jeanette Walls, who, to be fair, has suffered a lot of tribulations, basically says, I deserve to have protection. I deserve to be nourished and fed. Whereas her mother says, no, you are a better, more interesting character because of the hardships that we've put you through. So that's a symbol, right? The object is the tree. The abstract idea is growing up in the world, okay? The glass castle is a metaphor because it's not a real thing. OK, so could you actually envision a house made of glass? Absolutely. Right. So Saussure talks, talks about the idea of being able to create these formations in our mind because we have different signifiers to pull from. If I tell you, oh, I have a chair made out of cats, you're going to be able to picture that in your mind because of the different signifiers that you have. That's the way language works. If I say cat, you think of a very distinct thing in your head. Something pops up. Maybe it's a cartoon image of a cat. Maybe it's a cat you've seen in a picture. Maybe it's your own cat. Maybe it's one of my cats. Whatever it is, you have a picture in your head. So if I say a chair made of cats, you can put all of those pieces together and you can envision that. And that's what the glass castle is for Rex Walls. That's Jeanette's father. But is it a real thing? No. It's a not practical object. If you think about a castle, a castle is supposed to fortify and defend. But if it's made of glass, tell me in the chat, what's wrong with a castle that's made of glass? Tell me in the chat, what's wrong with a castle that's made of glass? Beautiful, Blanford, it can shatter. It can break. 
which kind of defeats the purpose, right? If a castle is supposed to fortify and protect, it can break easily. Exactly right, Sullivan. So it kind of defeats its own purpose. However, it's the one thing that keeps Rex Walls progressing forward. It's his dream. It's his vision. Is it real? Is it ever actually attainable? No, but it's his hope. So Emily Dickinson says hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul. And that's what the glass castle is for Rex Waltz. It's his symbol. It's his metaphor. And it becomes this long developing metaphor for Rex Waltz throughout the novel. And we hear Jeanette Walls fall in love with this idea because she really wants to believe that her father has the best interests of the family in mind. He's not holding down a job. He's not really feeding them very well. He's not really giving them a stable place to live because he wants something better for them. Even if it's something unattainable, he wants something better for them. So when we talk about the idea of a metaphor, a metaphor becomes this long, complex, and it doesn't always have to be a symbol. It can be, you know, just a, an extended metaphor. But in The Glass Castle, this novel, The Glass Castle itself is an extended metaphor. And it becomes the idea of this beautiful, unattainable, unpractical thing, which pragmatically speaking doesn't work. It doesn't work, right? And that's kind of a metaphor for the whole construct of freedom. When we talk about freedom, and that was one of the things that you guys said in the very first week, I said, what is it to be successful in America? And you said to have enough either money or power or you know education or whatever it is to be free. There's a problem with freedom. If you have that much freedom, it comes with all of these aspects of problematic feeding, right? Like how do we take care of ourselves? How, if I'm completely and totally free, like now I'm completely and totally responsible. So when we talk about these ideas, the glass castle itself becomes this very complex metaphor for it's a beautiful, wonderful thing and we want it, but it may not be as practical as we'd like it to be, okay? Okay, so let me turn off the camera so that you guys can turn yours back on. Hang on, stop recording.